Presented by Climate Power Education Fund. Does big oil care about our streets flooding or our home burning? Not according to an ExxonMobil top lobbyist. Did we aggressively fight against um, uh, some of the science? Uh, yes. You know, we were looking out for our shareholders. They care about profits, not people. Learn more at polluters.exposed. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Invested. I'm Danielle Town. For our happy summer little From the Vault series here, I'm playing our second episode on commodities, which is something that we've gotten many questions on. So enjoy this way back episode from 2015 and happy summer. Hey, everybody, this is Phil Town. This is Danielle Town. We're here for the podcast Invested, where we're talking about Warren Buffett style investing, uh, the best investors in the world, what they do to get very high rates of return with very low risk relative to um, what uh, relative to just putting your money out there in the market and hoping and praying. And we're, we're talking, talking about, about the practice of investing, the practice that of investing, how to approach it from a, uh, a perspective of, of learning and constantly growing with it and <laughs> Hopefully what that can do for us in the rest of our lives. I feel like if I can get a little confidence around this crazy thing, maybe I can do whatever else I want. Well, a big a big part of that confidence comes from understanding uh, the, that what investing really is, is buying low and selling high. That's the essence of investing, um, <laughs> <laughs> which seems kind of. Obvious. I feel like that should be a block quote somewhere. Phil Town News <laughs> informs us, buy low, sell high. <laughs> I know. I know. It's, it's embarrassing to say it because it has become. No, but I take your point that it's not said very. I mean, it's said in the sense of like, it's obvious, but, you know, it's nice to to think about it as like, wait a second. That's actually what we're trying to do for real. We're not gambling. We're not trying to go all over the place. We're just buying something at a good price and then selling it at a higher price. The the, the most astonishing thing about being a little embarrassed about saying that investing is about is is just buying low and selling high is that it's it's that would be ridiculed by ninety five percent of the people who teach and teach people how to invest and or, or do financial advice or or manage money. Ninety five percent of them would argue that that's silly, you know, silly. No would agree with it but what they would say is well the question is how do you do that <laughs> no that is that is precisely wrong oh okay because explain modern portfolio theory says that you cannot buy something on sale everything is priced properly to its real value and 95 percent of the money that's managed in the united states is managed with modern portfolio theory so those people are dead serious. They're going to tell you, and you can read all kinds of books that'll tell you this, that you can't, you cannot buy something low. That doesn't exist. And by the way, you can't. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, it sounded to me like you were talking about apples and oranges there, because on the one hand, you know, you can buy at a, a lower price and then sell at a higher price. And at both times, the market could be priced efficiently in theory. Right. Uh, yeah, that's right. If if you're meaning lower in the sense of uh, lower, than what you sell. lower than what you sold it for. Yeah. Right. But <laughs> but you're saying by by buy it at a low price, you mean literally a price that is lower than its value. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's just what normal people would think about pricing. Right. Not some hotshot financial guy, but just regular us. We'd go out and, you know, look at a used car and the guy would go like, OK, I want 5000 for this Toyota. You go and then in your mind, you're thinking, is that a low price or is that a high price? Right. Not not that I'm buying it for 5000 I'm going to sell it for 10 You know that. Oh, so this is low compared to what I'm going to sell it for because I have a crystal ball that tells me, you know, I'm going to sell it for 10 It No, we just normal human beings understand these things way better than the financial geniuses. Trust me, those guys haven't got a clue. It's unbelievable how locked in they are on modern portfolio theory. And they would honestly take your point and say, oh, yeah, well, what we mean by buy low and sell high is that you buy it today for a lower price than you sell it for in the future. But what we mean by that 
is that we're going to buy it low, buy it for a low price means you're buying it for less than it's worth. Okay. I mean, maybe I'm secretly a financial genius, but I took it in the former sense. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is, the, that's okay. It's the way the rest of the world does it too. And as long as they keep doing it, we're going to keep making a lot of money. So I, I would like everybody else out there who, who wants to do well with their investing to re, uh, restructure your thinking about what buy low, sell high means. It, it, it literally means buying low means you're going to buy it for lower than what it's worth. And selling high means you're going to sell it for higher than what it's worth. And that is precisely what Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger do. And that's what we teach at Rule One Investing. And, so and let's that's, talk about doing that with commodities. Good luck on that one. <laughs> commodities are priced according to supply and demand right so commodities can be theoretically they're priced according to supply and demand actually let me step back one step here and and, and answer this basic question about why it's possible that really smart people would sell something for less than it's worth right so we've talked about this a number of times. And what it all boils down to is they're going to do it if they're afraid. If they're afraid that it's the price is going down aggressively in the near future, they're going to unload that thing for less than it's worth as a long-term investment. Because hmm. they don't care about the long-term investment. It's not, not what they're interested in. What they're interested in is um, what's it doing now? And what's it going to continue to do over the next, you know, how, you know, however long their horizon is. And for most of these people out there who are investing or trading, their horizon is three months, four months, maybe six months, but very rarely longer than that. Whereas our horizon, Warren Buffett's horizon, Charlie Munger's horizon, Manesh Pabrai's horizon is years. We're looking way out into the future. So the dramatic difference there. So the first thing is that supply uh, and demand are one feature of commodity prices. And the second is that fear and greed are the other feature of commodity prices uh, that can drive prices dramatically. Like we were talking about last time, the fear that Egyptian cotton wasn't going to be harvested drove cotton prices from 85 cents to two and a quarter. And, and that the fear and greed are based on rumors a lot of time and speculation about weather speculation about world events. Yep, such exactly. Such as in that example, the era of spring, so all it, kinds of predictions about the future. Exactly. And so with commodities, commodities are a tougher, tougher deal than than stocks in a, in a lot of ways because the prices are driven by supply and demand and, and you you have to really have a, a lot of knowledge to know that somebody can't just come out with a big old pile of wheat or, co or cotton or oranges or whatever. They can't just find it someplace and drive the price down. Um, and as a as a way of thinking about that, I went out and took a look at prices in various commodities over the last, you know, 30 years. I, I mean, one of the reasons that people like to buy commodities is because they think it's a hedge against inflation. Um, okay. Because in, inflation essentially means higher prices, right? right? So if you own the end object you own the thing that is the the price uh, that you own the oh, thing okay, sure and then the price is going up you're you're doing better because then you can sell the thing for that higher price exactly so let, let's take a look at at uh, at gold for example gold is a commodity um, it is also a kind of quasi currency it's a hedge against fear and so on. And so people yeah, you mentioned, can I just break in for a second? You mentioned gold really quickly on our last podcast as a commodity. And I thought, wait a second, we just talked about it as a currency. Is it traded on two different markets as two different things? Well, it's not traded at there's no gold currency market. It, there is a gold market like okay. in, in the commodity. So when exchange. we talked about gold in the context of currency, it's traded on the commodity market, right? Okay. Exactly. Um, so let's take a look at gold. Gold was about eight hundred dollars an ounce in uh, 1980, and since 1980, we've had inflation um, that ran, I think, ballpark doubling prices in about 20, 25 to 30 years. So let's just say roughly that whatever cost a dollar 
back in 1980 now cost two dollars roughly okay all right um so gold at eight hundred dollars if you bought it in 1980 if it was to keep up with inflation then by now it should be sixteen hundred dollars okay ballpark right ballpark and um and it's actually at one thousand so roughly so gold didn't maintain its value relative to inflation over the last 30 years, if you'd bought it at 1980. Um, as of now. As of but now. it was much higher, right? It was at 1800 back about six or seven years ago. So it went way past its inflation rate. It looked like, wow, gold's a great storehouse of value because it's better than keeping up with inflation. And then it crashed down, and now it's 60% below where it should be if it was keeping up with inflation. Okay. And this is the problem with, with a supply and demand product is it's not directly correlated to inflation, particularly over any kind of relatively short period of time. I'm talking like five or 10 years. Um, over a longer period of time, maybe it would. But it, it, again, it's about supply and demand. If somebody came up with a huge gold strike, gold prices would have trouble going up because now there's a lot more gold in the world. Um, so gold did that. And then if we looked at uh, oil, for example, in 1980 um, to today, you would think oil would have exploded, right? I mean, it was getting less and less of it, less and less of it. But <laughs> it it did explode. I mean, it went up to $150 a barrel. But in 1980, it was at $40 a barrel. Hmm. 1980, $40, $40 a barrel. And it's at $35 a barrel today. Really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. So it's been it's lost half of its buying power yeah. over the last thirty years. It's now at in other words, it would be like buying oil at fifteen dollars a barrel back in nineteen eighty or twenty dollars a barrel. So Well that's just I mean I, that's just a function of the day that we're talking about this, right? Because if we had been talking about this when it was $150 a barrel, you'd be saying, and today it's $150 a barrel. Um, Absolutely. So, so the point is it goes all over the place. The, the, we're getting there. That's the point. It's going all <laughs> over the place. And it's never forget, it's driven by supply and demand. So you have different kinds of demand going on, right? Gold. The demand on gold is what? There's a little bit of jewelry. There's a little bit of industrial but the demand on gold is a fear demand. Mm -hmm. You know, I have fear over paper fiat currencies. Mm -hmm. And gold is amazingly fungible. Somebody's always going to take it. It's not German gold or French gold or American gold that nobody will take because Americans are, you know, spenders and Germans are savers. It's nothing to do with that. It's just gold. Mm -hmm. So it moves across borders rather nicely. So it's a it's a fear based deal and for a while china was storing up gold like crazy they were they were sucking it up and then they decided they'd better stop doing that and stop spend start spending some of that and uh and they stopped buying it and that's one of the things that caused it to start to go down so you know oil you would think would keep up with inflation and here we are as you say as a moment in time right now with an enormous supply of oil coming onto the market saudi arabia picking unbelievable what they did right First, the frackers came in and suddenly created four million barrels of oil a day extra out of thin air in America. And then um, that started putting pressure on oil prices in Saudi Arabia, which had been controlling oil prices through OPEC since 1972 or so, suddenly came out and said, we're not going to cut our price. In fact, we're going to increase production because we don't want you guys taking our market share. And so they actually increased production from 9 million barrels of oil a day to 12 million barrels of oil a day, pouring it in here, driving the price down in order to destroy their competition. Very tough. And now Iran may be coming on to the market with another 3 million barrels of oil a day or more, which should have another huge impact from the frackers in Saudi Arabia. So think about it. If Iran comes online with 3 million, Saudi Saudi's increased by 3 million, and we got 4 million out of thin air from frackers, that's, that's uh, 10 million barrels of oil in about a 40 million a barrel of oil a day market. In other words, 25% more supply. Yeah. That's going to crush the price, right? So 
the price goes down like a brick. And now oil and this particular point in time has failed to keep up with inflation at all. Um, even though at one point it was like up 1400 percent. Now it's down. Um, and then the other place that like there's a really good investor named Jim Rogers, who you really got to read his book. He wrote a book called Investment Biker. That is the best book. Yeah. I read that book when I was like 10 years old, I think. And it made me want to drive a motorcycle around the world. I know. It's way cool. He put like 40,000 miles on this BMW with his girlfriend and and checked out the stock. I, I loved this. He was checking out the stock exchange in Argentina. You know, they, yeah. first first you got to go find it down some you back go alley. Find it. Yeah. It was totally, I was like, oh my God. Like it was so like entrepreneurial. I got so excited. I'm like nine. I'm like reading this book. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And uh, he wrote a book on commodities. I, I don't remember the name of it right now, but just go look it up or we'll put it in the show notes um, what the book is. And um, and he talks about how China and India are coming on with more and more people and moving into the middle class. You know, China has like three times more people than America does. India has the same thing. And and so you you if if all these people are moving into the middle class, it's going to mean they're going to want more refrigerators, more cars. They're going to use more energy. They're going to use more lumber. They're going to use more of everything. Hmm. And they're going to eat more food. And that the world population is going to go from 7 billion to 9 million over the next 20 years or so. And as a result, the pressure on commodities is going to be enormous. Now, Jim did not see this commodities crash. He has been pumping the commodity boom ever since the year 2000. And he's sticking with it, even though everything has crashed. He's basically just saying this is a temporary thing as a result of China stopping its build out. Um, very difficult to know who's right here. I'm not I'm not an expert in this by any means. So just saying he he's just an absolute inflation bull. It's going to happen. There's going to be massive inflation because it, it must happen because of population growth and people move into the middle class. So Jim's out there going, hey, you know, get get agriculture. I listened to him once. He just like go buy rice patties, go buy, you know what? Because the world is going to need it down the road. OK, so he must be saying that agriculture will keep up with inflation, right? That's the, the whole point. So let's take a look at agriculture. It's like if we take a look at the grain index, um, which you can Google, I think it's uh, yeah, GSCI, Google GSCI, um, S&P GSCI, and you'll get a grain index chart. You can kind of see how grain prices have moved around, which is an indication of agriculture. And um, these things were priced about 150. Then they went to 900, and now they're down to 312. So this is an indexed price of several different grains that are yep. on the commodities markets? Yep, exactly. Okay. So it's kind of like the S&P 500 index or or the Russell index, but this one is and for say, grains. say again how much it's moved? That sounded like a lot. So the index in 1980 was at 150, and then it went all the way up to 900, making Jim Rogers look like a genius, sure. right? That was by 2008. And then it's come down like a brick. So now it went from 900 down to 312. In other words, interestingly, from 1980 to now, agriculture actually kept pace with inflation. Right. It doubled in the overall. last 30 years overall, overall. And it but it's gone through this wild ride. Corn, uh, as another example, was at about two dollars and 50 cents a bushel for a long time. It was at two dollars and 50 cents a bushel in two in 1948. And in 19 in 2005, it was at two dollars and 48 cents a bushel. So here you have what is that? That's like 60 years. 60 years and it's the same price. Why? Because farmers supplied more and more and more at a higher rate of supply growing than demand was growing. So the price stayed pretty even. There's been big changes. Like in 1975, there was a big shortage and the price went to $10 a bushel from mm -hmm. 250. And then it, you know, here we are, you know, 30 years later it's at it's at 5 and it, or at uh, 250 and then in 2008 it got up to about $5 a bushel. And then farmers planted corn everywhere. And, uh, you know, ethanol subsidies are involved in this as well. And so, you know, it's just this huge wild ride. But it looks like, indeed, agricultural prices kind of keep up with inflation if you can go through the rides. 
So you want to, if you wanted to buy one of these things, you'd kind of be looking at, okay, where are we relative to inflation on agriculture? Because ultimately, that's kind of how uh, inflation prices are are calculated in the first place. Is they're going to look at the real goods that are out there and um, and figure out the price of uh, the the basically the rate of inflation growth. So that's kind of how you could look at uh, at commodities. Um, so I'm going to. I'm, I'm kind of running out of out of stuff to tell you about. You got any? any <laughs> you know, I don't know. Don't know where you want to go I from here. I'm just letting you run. <laughs> I didn't know where you're going. With it. Um, okay, so here's my next question. Okay. Um, thinking about this from like you know a stock investing perspective, if I want to buy oil or wheat or orange juice, why wouldn't I buy just a company that sells oil or wheat or orange juice? Like, why don't I buy? Um, I don't know, BP instead of the oil commodity? Or why don't I buy um, like Minute Maid instead of orange juice? Well, before I answer that, let me let me start by saying there's several different ways you can own a commodity. And the uh, purchasing the equity is one of those ways. So you can own, you can sort of quasi own oil by owning BP. That's kind of what you're suggesting. But the first way to own it is to just take delivery get your barrels of oil and put them in your garage. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So here you have a very large garage full of oil. Probably not the best way to do things. Although when it comes to gold, that's exactly what a lot of people want to do. Hmm. Right? They want physical gold. They want it in a vault. They want it in the vault in their basement or they want it in a bank. If if I go buy gold on the commodities market, will gold be delivered to me? Indeed it will. If you take a futures contract on gold and you don't sell it, they're going to ship you the gold. It's like Amazon for gold. <laughs> exactly. And there is, I mean, you can you can buy gold through brokers, of course. They charge you a little fee. Um, the only thing is that the level, the amount of supply that you'd end up with is going to cost you a couple bucks if you do it on the commodities market. Because they don't just do one bar, you know. I mean, they don't do just one barrel of oil. They don't just do one bushel of wheat. They do big, huge blocks of these things called contracts, and you have to buy the whole thing. And I, right off the top of my head, I've, I've never looked at what the gold contract is, but I'm pretty sure it's more than one bar. And uh, <laughs> it might be enough to load to up your... To make the shipping cost worthwhile. <laughs> exactly. Um, and to make the holding costs and so on. So so you can take physical... physical, but But when you take physical ownership of something like silver or gold or whatever... Um, obviously, you have a storage issue, which isn't so bad with gold and silver, but gets crazy with other things. Um, the second way you can do this is you can go through an intermediary that's going to take physical delivery for you. Okay. Um, and so, for example, uh, gold has an exchange traded fund, an ETF, that is uh, essentially a kind of mutual fund for that specific thing, gold. And there are exchange traded funds for about everything you can dream of now. There's literally thousands of them um, where you can essentially have an intermediary. If you wanted to do a commodity commodities fund, you can do an exchange traded fund that would buy futures in all these different markets. You would have a piece of wheat, a piece of corn, a piece of cotton, gold, oil, coal, you name it. You would own pieces of it in this but basket of commodities. So that's a way to do it, to purchase it without worrying that you're going to have a shipment of gold showing up at your house. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, or, or even worse, a shipment of wheat. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's unlike gold. Yeah. <laughs> and All right. So, so you can go and, and buy it on the exchange traded funds. Um, which I imagine you could do through a stock brokerage or, you know, a brokerage online. Yeah, um, you can do that through a brokerage online. Like Goldman Sachs runs a, a, a commodity index called GSCI. This episode is brought to you by HP+. In a world full of smart devices, shouldn't your printer be smart too? It is with HP+. These printers know when they're running low, so you always get the ink you need delivered right when you need it. Plus, you save up to 50% on ink, so you can print whatever you want, as much as you want, any time you want. Huh, that is pretty smart. Get six free months of instant ink when you choose HP+. Conditions apply. Visit hp.com smart for details. 
And okay. that's if you don't know any of the other ones, just just go go get GSCI, take a look at it. You can wiki it, and it'll tell you about how they how they put it in it, how they weight it. Um, you know, because obviously an index has to try to figure out what's an appropriate weighting. If the idea is to keep up with inflation, you know, you could get things really screwed up. So there's a lot of thinking that goes into deciding how you're going to structure your your index. Um, I'm not sure what it is right now. I don't really have any idea, but basically they put into it crude oil. Um, they put in gas, heating oil. Uh, so they got all kinds of different energy. They've got metals like aluminum, copper, and lead and stuff like that, gold, silver. They've got about seven or so different kinds of crops they put in, and then they put in livestock as well. So it's broadly diversified across livestock, agriculture, precious metals, um, industrial metals, and energy. But how well it's tracking inflation depends a lot on how right these guys are who are managing it. So mm. just something to know when you're looking around at different indexes. Jim Rogers has another one um, that he put together in 2000, which you could look at. Just Google Rogers Commodity Index. Um, and I'm sure Vanguard's got one. It's, so you just try to take a look and see how they've been performing relative to the prices of things. And uh, I don't have a favorite or I'd tell you what it is um, because I don't tend to invest in these in these exchange traded funds so much. I worry about the exchange traded funds a little bit, actually, I'll tell you, Danielle, because right now, as we're speaking, um, particularly exchange traded funds that are investing in bond uh, in bonds are uh are having some problems, having some serious problems. Um, because sometimes when you buy stuff for... So these are different than these commodity ETFs that you were just talking about. Yeah, these are bond ETFs, but they indicate one of the one of the, con, one of the problems, sort of unexpected consequences of having a lot of people investing in a single index. And that is that when they put this exchange rate fund, these funds together for bonds, people were trying to get higher and higher yields and so they, the people running the ETF went out and bought junk bonds. Okay. So these are bonds that are low rated and they provide a high return because they're low rated. And so in a marketplace where U.S. Treasuries for 10 years, if you bought a U.S. Treasury bill for 10 years, you'd get 2.3%. These guys went out and got these bonds to perform and give people 5%. Okay, way more, more than double in an index uh, exchange traded fund. Now, how did they do that? Well, they went in and bought into the market and bought these bonds. And unfortunately, these bonds for corporations and and uh, and issuers that are not all that stable or at, at risk, they're not very liquid. Not very many people are out there buying these things and selling them. So when these big exchange traded funds came in and bought this stuff, they paid a pretty good price for it. Right? There's nobody out there competing with them, so the 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 guys who were selling it could raise the price. And now when it's time to sell them, as they the people are trying to sell them into the teeth of the Federal Reserve raising interest rates, mm -hmm. my God, the price they're getting is far, far lower than often what they paid. Is that true as well for these commodity ETFs? It can be. For example, if you were... So this is kind of like a harbinger of a warning sign yeah, for it's other a, ETFs. Exactly. Is that when you get somebody in there buying, literally taking ownership of um, a lot of gold, you know, you are creating the market. Mm -hmm. It's like you're stimulating the market. You're injecting it with billions of dollars that didn't exist before out there to buy gold because people didn't want to own the gold bar, didn't want to store it. They, you know, but whoa, hey, I do want gold in case everything melts down. So they put the money in the ETF. The ETF goes out and puts the money into gold. What's going to happen when everybody wants to actually get out? Well, who's yeah. going to buy it? Right? Yeah. So you may have a real problem exiting a liquid ETF. It may not be able to exit easily at a good price. These things might get very volatile. So um, let's but let's come back to uh, to these to the basic concepts here that um, these ETFs provide a way to do it. Uh, you can get gold. They put the gold in the vault. So when you buy a piece, oh, let me just tell you, uh, the, the major ETF for gold is GLD. Okay. GLD. <laughs> so gold. And yep. what, what you do when you buy into that is you're basically telling them, go buy this much gold and put it in the vault. And when you okay. sell your shares of, e of that ETF, you're telling them, okay, fine, take the gold out, sell it and give me my money. So they keep a balance of one to one gold bars in a vault 
for dollars that were put into the fund or taken out of the fund. Um, so that's the third way to, or the second way to, to, to do it. Equities are the third way. So first you take physical delivery. Second, you have an intermediary take physical delivery, which is an ETF. Third, you, and we'll come back to this, you buy the company that drills oil or finds gold. That's equities. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, then, so that, but, is, that is a way to buy commodities. For except sure. Except you're also buying all the stuff that company is doing. Right. Or you can do the fourth way, which is you go to the futures market, which is uh, the commodities exchanges, CME uh, exchange in, uh, uh, in Chicago is a place where you can go. And they have co commodities exchange gold contracts. And this is where you would actually take physical delivery of the gold that we talked about a bit, a bit ago and get ready to load up your garage with gold bars from your contract. Oh, okay, so buying a commodity does not necessarily mean that you are buying a future of that commodity. Is that correct? Right. If you well, if you take physical delivery, you're literally buying it and putting it in your garage when you when you get shipment. Yeah, it's just people always I mean that's obvious, but people always say like, "Oh, I'm buying commodities." But what they really mean is they're buying commodity futures yeah, that are being traded. Precisely. They're buying futures. And there's another real gotcha hanging out there that some people have pointed out. Uh, and I don't know for sure that this is a, a huge gotcha, but I just want to let you know that um, some people are some traders are saying that they believe that the ratio of gold actually able to be delivered relative to the paper derivative contracts is about 200 paper ounces of gold for every actual ounce of gold. And that could be a problem <laughs> if everybody said, give me the gold. And this, yeah. this, this seems impossible, but this is exactly what happened in the, in the first half of the 2000s leading up to the big financial crisis is that, remember we were talking about derivatives earlier, that a piece of paper can be a derivative, is created as a derivative to the underlying stuff, whatever it is. That piece of paper is then very tradable. And what happened with uh, with mortgage bonds is they took those pieces of paper and stacked them into big stacks of a thousand bonds, a thousand pieces of paper, and then they sold off tranches of this as a bond. And, um, and then people came along and said, wow, we need to get some insurance on these on the on the bond that was created from all these pieces of paper and they created an insurance product that became another piece of paper so now they had a piece of paper tracking a piece of paper which was tracking the underlying mortgage and they could repeat that they could they could make as many of these insurance pieces of paper as people wanted hmm. which meant essentially the insurance paper took the place of the underlying real thing yeah. because it operated exactly the same way and then except that's there were many of them, except there were too many. It's as if as if you've got one house and it and it's insured by a thousand different insurance companies, each of them going to pay off if the house burns down. Right. God, It's just extraordinary, isn't it? It's so frustrating. It's amazing that this happened. Yeah. I mean, they're all going to pay off, but only one of them is going to get the land. Right. right. <laughs> so if that house ever burns down, you're going to have a nightmare. You're going to have all of these it's, investors, had. which is what we had. Everybody, everybody's saying, OK, give me my money. And the guy is saying, well, I, Danielle, I can't give you your money until I get my money from Bob. Right. And Bob is saying, I need my money from Bill. So do you think that could happen in the gold market now? Is that what people are saying? That's what the, the, the issue is, is that if there's a run on gold, there's no gold. It's mm -hmm. all paper. Mm -hmm. And that means that you have this counterparty risk they call it like the the guy on the other side has to pay me before i can pay you sure. and that chain of counterparty risk it will will, will destroy itself so yeah. there's a real question there about what's i would stay the would heck away say, from that i know that you're not a commodities expert but would you say that that's true for more commodities than just gold like is that i imagine if that's happening with gold that's happening with a lot of different commodities that's a great question i don't have the first clue about whether that's true or not i suspect um it's possible because these commodity markets are highly leveraged um 
people are putting down a dollar and and they always have been, you know, putting down a dollar and they're controlling two hundred dollars of stuff. So many people who trade commodities, probably most of them don't want the actual commodity. So they right. don't care. And they want a small movement in price to create a large gain. So they're leveraged like crazy in the commodities market. And so I would I would say, you know, the commodities market has the potential for for having huge explosions and problems going on in it. Um, and it's really not a place for an investor to be that for an investor. This is this is a great place to be a speculator and a gambler, but it's not a great place to be an investor. Re only reason really that I would want to be in the futures market is if I'm a I'm a wheat grower and I want to protect myself. And so at some point in time, um, we are going to talk about these futures markets in terms of the stock option markets, hmm, which okay. is what the options markets and stocks grew out of and how to go about protecting your stock positions the way a wheat farmer would protect his wheat crop prices by using stock options in a certain kind of way. But we'll get to that down the road. That's that's not something for right now. For right now, the main thing to understand about commodities is that they're incredibly volatile. Um, but in the long run, they track inflation pretty well. Um, okay. And the second thing is that you can get them four different ways with futures, which is really risky because it's leveraged and scary. Um, as an exchange traded fund, which is how many people do it, or take physical delivery. And then the one we really haven't discussed much is the equity side of things. Um, you yeah, brought this up right off the bat. That, that buys or makes that thing. Yep. So if you wanted to own gold, you could own gold bars. You could own a GLD ETF. You could get into a futures contract on gold, or you could go buy uh, Barrick Gold or one of the gold mining companies. Hmm. Now, okay. you, you can see right away that that might be different. Yeah, I think we should talk more about that as we go forward in terms of valuing these commodities because obviously when you're buying a company you're buying all the people or you know, you're buying people you're buying what they're doing you know what i mean they're buying you're buying their plans for you you're buying their ability to run the company well you're buying their um their expertise and the particular durable competitive advantage of that company and yet it's all based around a commodity so i find that very interesting it is really really interesting and i'll tell you just really quickly um, that if you're going to buy a business that that produces a commodity, there's it's very difficult to say that there's a durable competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody cares that it's barrack it's gold. Fungible, it's we fungible, talking. exactly. Nobody cares. So yeah. what kind of a durable competitive advantage could a company have yeah. that's commodity? Right. Very interesting. Let's okay, let's talk about that. You want to talk about it now or we do it next no, time? No, let's talk about that next time. I feel okay. like that's a bigger subject. All right. I also want to talk about robo advisors. I mentioned a couple times ago that somebody had a question about that. So um, I want to get into that a little bit. Well, There's I, so many of them out there. That's, I think instead of starting over with commodities as, uh, as looking at companies, yeah, we could do that. I'm, I'm just thinking really easily to understand how you'd go about buying a company that is a commodity producer. What you have to do is you have to find out if they're the low cost producer. That's really what you care about. In other words, that's the only moat that a commodities company could have. Nobody no, really cares about others. it. You've mentioned others. Well, there's others out there. But if they're a commodity producer, think about an oil company, right? What's the difference between Exxon, Chevron and so on? Okay, it's bigger than I thought. We'll go into it next time. <laughs> okay, let's talk about it next time. <laughs> I'm getting the Danielle signal to kill it, kill it. All right, we got to run. So next time, commodities. And then down the road, either next time or the next time after that, robo-advisors, which are interesting. Yeah. Right. Um, check out Instagram. It's my only social media. Um, I can't stand everything else, but I like Instagram invested with Danielle and, um, and send us your questions, questions at investedpodcast.com. Thanks everybody. Thanks you guys. Time to go play. See ya. Hey, thanks for listening to invested the rule one podcast. If you like this episode, you can always get our show notes and more details and links to the resources we discussed at investedpodcast.com. Also, as long as you're online, head on over to investedpodcast.com slash 
workshop. For details on an upcoming three-day live workshop that I'm hosting, all you gotta do to go is enter the special podcast code STOCKPILE, that's S-T-O-C-K-P-I-L-E, STOCKPILE, into the application form, and you guys can attend for free. So everything discussed on this show is either my opinion or it's Danielle's opinion, and it is not to be taken as investment advice because I am not your investment advisor, nor have I considered your personal situation as your fiduciary. This podcast is for your entertainment and education only, and I really do hope you've enjoyed it. So until next week, it's time to go play. See ya.